as I say, as soon as we get details on these new Rob Ford uh, revelations, uh, documents about his former colleague and driver, Mr. Lisi, they've just been released by the court. They're literally just out. We're checking in to see what's in them, and we will bring you the Rob Ford details in a minute. But another apparent soldier, Canadian soldier, has committed suicide allegedly certainly being investigated for that that would make four deaths in just one week defense officials have confirmed that military police are now investigating the death of master corporal Sylvain Lelivio he was 46 years old he served in the 3rd battalion of the Royal 22nd Regiment at CFB Valcarche Quebec he had served on two tours in Bosnia one tour of duty in Afghanistan the soldier was found dead in his home on Monday. Investigators say suicide is a possibility, as I say. Now, medical experts warn that we could see a growing number of mental illness and suicide cases as lingering psychological wounds from the Afghan war beginning to manifest. And the Auditor General has also warned in a report last year that this is a serious problem. So is the military, is the government doing enough to mitigate the damage? What more supports are needed? Let's get some reaction. Aaron O'Toole is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. He's here. He's also a vet. Jack Harris is the NDP's National Defense Critic. And so Joyce Murray, the Liberal National Defense Critic, is here. Good to see all of you. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, uh, across the country, obviously, thoughts and prayers going out to those families. Four military deaths in a matter of days. All vets of the Afghan war. Um, we don't know if they're all suffering from PTSD or suffered from it. It's obviously a v real problem. What's the government's reaction in terms of accusations that not enough is being done for soldiers seeking mental health help? Well, Evan, I think it's important to say two things off the top. First, to echo your sentiments, uh, you know, condolences to the families and really the people left behind by these tragedies. The second, and I want to be unequivocal here, is suicide is, is not an option and our soldiers out there and if there is anyone out there struggling with issues whether operational stress related or personal issues they've got to know that, that that's not the option to take there are people there to help the military is built on a culture of supporting your buddies supporting your unit uh, reach out to them reach out to members of the family and get help because help is there and unfortunately um, I, I think sometimes one can lead to another and and we need them to know that it's, it's not the way out. And but sir, but sir what we, you know, you're tagging into people that potentially are suffering from serious mental health issues. They might be suffering from PTSD. What is it the right, is the message to them suicide is not an option? Is that, in a sense, blaming them for taking an option of last resort? Look, you know, we celebrate the service of the men and women of the Canadian Forces uh, regularly here in the House of Commons. and. And, you know, since I left uniform myself, I've worked to try and uh, show attention to the needs of military families, our veterans. These are very important issues, and the government should be held to account in a responsible way to say, uh, are we doing enough? It's, it's one of our most important mandates uh, as an MP is to make sure we provide for our veterans. I, I, as a veteran myself, I, I clearly think our government is trying to respond to this growing need. We, we are op opening operational stress injury clinics. We have joint personal support uh, clinics at bases that work with serving members, that work with veterans in the base area. Uh, we're supporting great programs done by, by uh, physicians at, at the University of British Columbia, like the Veterans Transition Program, uh, bringing that out nationally. Um, certainly we know there's going to be more men and women struggling with, with OSIs. But Evan, when we cover these, these stories, these tragedies, we have to say to those people that may be struggling, uh, that that's not the option to take it's to reach out and we've got to make sure that we continue to to do enough uh, and to to support our veterans well, well, okay well let, let me bring in um, Jack Harris w what's your take here is the government responding is the system responding to soldier service men and women who need help I think first of all obviously we have to echo the sentiments and concerns of the families and condolences to the lost lost uh, to loved ones uh, but you know the families of some of these individuals, and we don't have all the stories, have complained or were complaining that they weren't getting the help that they need. So, you know, you can say we're, we're, we're doing things that we weren't doing before, but clearly people aren't getting that help. There has to be 
more done. You know, we've, we do have a shortage of, of personnel. We don't. We have, we're receiving criticism from all sorts of people about the ineffectiveness of the delivery of some of these services. Uh, and we also have some policies that act against a, a, a positive future for people who come forward and say that but I have some serious problem. As was said earlier in the House today, the clock starts ticking on a potential medical release before you are ultimately ready to go, before you get a pension, before you have some other, uh, other uh, place to go to, and a medical release because you're actually unfit to go back and risk your life again. So we have this universality of service policy. And what I'd like to see is a signal from the minister, from the military, say we're prepared to examine that and give people, if we can, uh, who are injured and uh, you know, have combat injuries, an option to stay in the service and do a job that may not require them uh, to, uh, to deploy. That would at least hold out some hope for people that uh, work your way through this and there may be some light at the end of the tunnel that would give you an option to continue. Uh, Joyce Murray, what's your reaction to this? Uh, obviously there's tragedy, everybody's uh, thoughts and prayers are going out to these families, these people who are clearly so, so desperate and yet there are going to be legitimate questions about the government resources uh, and the resources available to these men and women. Is it enough? Well, I think the, the vice chief of staff himself at our last uh, at the committee meeting where he testified expressed some concerns about uh, there being adequate resources at a time of uh, budget, budget cuts. Um, uh, Evan, I, I, when I hear of these uh, very sad, very uh, sad incidences, and I'm a mother of three young adults, so I can only imagine the pain the family members are going through, uh, the extended family, and. Uh, and, and sympathize deeply with that. The word that comes up for me is, uh, is despair. So these are people who don't feel any hope. They don't feel that uh, they can come forward perhaps, or if they do come, for come forward, there will be an outcome that is a bad outcome. Uh, so what are we doing? What is, the government needs to do something to, to really signal that that's going to change. But, that, but what, I mean, let's be concrete, what? Okay, what do you think well, let's, do? okay, so one concrete thing is just a few years ago, the government had no clinical psychologists or psychiatrists that was in its employ to support, uh, to support forces members. Now they have some, but it's woefully uh, inadequate. There's apparently some 75 medical professionals that are that have been uh, that are in the queue to be hired uh, but according to the ombudsman the process is so cumbersome and bureaucratic that they're they haven't been hired and uh, things aren't moving forward right there's so, the 380 uh, have been hired mental health professionals but there are yeah. some that haven't been hired Aaron O'Toole yeah. uh, and I think I think ahead. that the minister has to say that we are committed to making sure that when you come forward you can trust us to support you in every way that's needed and have a positive outcome for you and your family they uh, need to believe that they need to believe that there is hope at by getting help and right now there there are people afraid just the last thing i would mention is i completely disagree with the idea of having the full responsibility in the injured forces members hands to come forward i think there needs to be a screening process that uh, that identifies people that are at risk and begins to support them not wait for them to self-identify that's just not good enough all right, can I, let me just put something to you, uh, Mr. O'Toole. A special report from the National Defense Ombudsman said that since 2002, that office has identified uh, that the Canadian Forces should have 447 mental health providers to take care of its members. The report said it's never been more than, than as I just said to Joyce Murray, 380 practitioners. That number hasn't grown since 2010. The Ombudsman, Pierre Degla, told my colleague Rosemary Barton earlier, check this out. So our concern is that there are not enough uh, care providers there. Uh, and what's even more frustrating that last year, the Minister of Defense, Mr. McKinnon, did recognize and give $11.4 million to increase the mental health budget and hire more people. And we find out now that there are 76 people who have been screened, qualified, waiting to come in. They're in a pool, waiting pool, to come in in forces. So I don't know what's happening now. This seems to be a very cumbersome and <coughs> lengthy hiring process. Mr. O'Toole, Peter McKay, the former defense minister, has said outside caucus this morning that the government is planning to double the number of health care professionals. But the tragedies that we've seen in the last week, 
are so extreme that there's a clear urgency. What is the delay in getting the number of health providers that DND needs to help these soldiers? Uh, clearly, I, I agree with Peter and, and all of our caucus that want to get rid of any of this bureaucratic delay and, and get to those levels that we've committed to. We also want to, Evan, work with some of the top psychologists and psychiatrists that have been doing this outside in universities, in, in hospital settings. That The Veterans Transition Program I talked about, some of the expertise there, which I worked at bef with before becoming an MP, have been dealing with veterans and post-traumatic stress since the medic pocket, since Bosnia. And so there's actually some clinical expertise outside of Veterans Affairs and National Defense that we're already starting to partner with. But, but, but we've but, got to get those personnel. We absolutely right, but what do. is the delay? I mean, you know, some might say there's lives. People's lives are at stake here. I, I think we have to be very careful here to try and take the, the, the nitty-gritty politics out of this as much as possible. You know, I heard questions today tying some of the tragic events to Veterans Affairs Office closures that haven't even closed yet. Uh, you know, we've got to be very careful about how we, no, as on, no, public that's officials, not, that's not talk about today. these things in a responsible way. But because one but, but death but is to too fair, many. But to, you, to be fair, as the Ombudsman said, do you even have a database as to who's sick, who needs help? Do you have a, any idea? Are you tracking soldiers? What's the mechanism? I think you'll see, and I'm glad to hear the Chief of Defense Staff, who's attuned to these things, as is uh, Colonel Rakesh Jetley, who's heading this up from a Canadian Forces physician standpoint. We've got to make sure, as Joyce point, that people are not just self-identifying, that the chain of commands identifying, and, and okay, seeing with people but and the families. But answer the question, is there a way to do it? I mean, I'm, you're telling me what you should do, but are you doing it? Is there a way to identify, yes or no? There is a way, and in fact, commanders are being given the tools and should be constantly be given better tools on not just how to identify Evan, but also how to talk to the men and women in their units about tragedies like this. We've got to make sure that we do this responsibly so that we're not putting people that are on the cusp who are suffering and pushing them to making this decision. That's why I reiterate, well, we, are. That's we, the problem. we feel for these families, but soldiers are that are out there at risk, Suicide is not an option. There's people out there for you, and you need to seek help from friends and comrades. Jack Harris. Look, look they're, not, they're not delivering the services where the rubber hits the road. I mean, that's part of the problem here. This is, they've got great ideas, but, you know, there's other issues as well. There's been 50 outstanding boards of inquiry called since 2008 to, that have not been reported yet that to look into the to, to what happened in the suicide in the Canadian forces. It's unexcusable that that's four or five years would pass when the inquiry is supposed to come up with recommendations as to why this happened, what could be done, how this can be fixed, what other services need to be put in place. Why, you know, how can we say on the one hand that this is a priority and we're very concerned and on the other hand we have 50 of these reports and investigations outstanding and, and uh, with no recommendations that could fix some of these problems. I mean, we've got to, we've Got, you know, there's an article in the paper today has uh, in the, the embassy magazine uh, has has the uh, uh, has the Canadian forces lost their heart and soul and there's a certain element of truth in that that this is regarded as uh, you know a priority but it has to be balanced against other resources and that's in statements made within the military and that's just not acceptable these are people who should be treated uh, as just as seriously and just as, as uh, importantly as combat deaths that occurred during the mission in Afghanistan this is part Part of the cost of this mission and their deaths and their lives are just as important and ought to be All protected right. just as strongly. Uh, jo Joyce Murray, last word. Well, we can organize a military invasion in a matter of uh, days and weeks, but we don't seem to be able to organize a support network to 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 nurture the, our armed forces members who have been injured uh, in combat or in service. So. We can do it. I think it just takes will and it takes money. And the, the government should just get on it right now, put a, whatever kind of force they need behind this, the budget, and uh, bring the best ideas forward and get started and, and with Evan, something like I have like to address what tomorrow. Jack said. Um, Canadian Forces has not lost its heart. In fact, the Canadian Forces families are sometimes the most hurt by these tragedies. So we need less talk like that, which really is irresponsible. More we do need yeah. more action, but we also need to be serious about this and not play politics like we've seen this week. Uh, all right. I, I don't know who, what's playing politics. I, I mean, four soldiers dead. Obviously, there's a lot of questions going on as to what happened and lots more questions about the services these soldiers could be getting or are getting. Aaron O'Toole, Jack Harris, Joyce Murray, I always appreciate your time. Thank you to all three of you.
We like to note that the Canadian Forces does have a special hotline for members and for their families who do need help. It is a confidential, toll-free telephone service available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That number is 1-800-268-7708, 1-800-268-7708. I know a lot of veterans and a lot of soldiers do watch the program, obviously.